<clears throat> All right, we are uh, here gathered today together. Uh, I'm to uh, talking now to warm up my brain. <laughs> Associations here at the District of Church building. It's time to speak. In Hebrews 3, this morning we've got a slight beginning. This uh, chapter, so we want to delve into the contents of Hebrews 3 this morning. We're prepared today to worship, learn, grow, just a little bit in the hour. Metamorphosis of transformation by the continued rejoining of our lives. Oh, I'm starting to feel like this. <laughs> uh, big time for big time. Okay. All right, so, uh, Hebrews 3. Robert, would you like to do this? Our Almighty, All Loving Heavenly Father, we just uh, are so thankful for all that you provide us and we just recognize you as the one who creates all things and provides for all of our needs. We're mindful, Father, that uh, you've demonstrated your care for us in so many marvelous ways. We just pray that as we gather together during this time, uh, that we will have open and receptive hearts to your truth. We'll make every effort to apply your truths in our daily walk. We, we strive daily to be a reflection of your love. And we pray that as we engage with others, we can be effective and, and again, just demonstrating the, the love you've shown each one of us. Forgive us when we fall short. And, and again, be with Daryl, be with each one of us. That, we may grow closer to you day by day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Hebrews 3. So in the midst of this class this morning, there will be a change of emphasis. And when we come to that change of emphasis, then that will provide us with an opportunity to briefly go back and set this, the full stage again relative to how far we've come and uh, then we'll, we'll proceed uh, from there. Let us remember to whom this sermon was written and what the circumstances generally were under which these individuals are receiving this, this letter know that these were likely Hebrew Christians, although it's possible that there were uh, proselytes amongst them that were Gentiles. I don't think that's possible, but certainly there is no doubt that the recipients had a well-rounded knowledge of the Old Testament so that the writer could allude to the Old Testament, he could quote the Old Testament and the people would understand and he assumed that they would, what his point was as he used the Old Testament scriptures. So uh, we, <coughs> if we've been Christians long enough, hopefully we have had some instruction in the Old Testament, if we've studied some Old Testament books, have some kind of knowledge that will aid us, perhaps not as deeply as these people's knowledge who were, uh, who were born, basically, not uh, into it and then taught from children. But uh, we can, I think, do pretty well in keeping up. So let's, uh, in chapter three, we got a, a start. So I'll just read uh, just the beginning verses here and then we'll get into it. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. 
he was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. <coughs> At him and his, of course, or, or refers to God. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just as much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Right? So let's remember that this this heavenly calling was a calling that came from heaven and ends in heaven. Okay? And so they are partakers of this heavenly calling. Uh, and he tells them uh, to uh, uh, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. So we talked about what an apostle is, what he was sent. A high priest was the mediator between God and man. Jesus is called in 1 John 2, for instance, our advocate. An advocate with the Father, a, a defense lawyer, if you will, someone who pleads our case. And so God arranged to have him there. So it is not a thing where God would certainly take pleasure in destroying us if he possibly could. So he put Jesus between us as a buffer, uh, though, he, though he would love to get at us. He, he, no, <laughs> that's not the reason. Uh, we have sinned. We fall short of the glory of God. We can't undo that. God is just. And so his justice has to be satisfied, and it was satisfied in the cross. And Jesus now has been placed in a position of our mediator. There was one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, he offered himself as a ransom, right? His blood as a ransom to God. And we are free. We are absolutely free. We paid the price. So there's going to be, as you saw in the reading, there is a if in there. And we'll talk about that, that if there is just, just a little bit. And so, uh, so we're considering Jesus' humanity uh, in this general context. We'll go back and set that in a little bit. And so uh, so, he is the high priest of our confession. So, when we confess, and apparently there is a confession, uh, he is the object of this. He is the high priest of our confession. So, what is that about? So I'm talking Christians here, where all of us fit, or this applies to all of us who are here. You know? And um, so our confession, Paul said that, for instance, in 1 Timothy 6, 13, that um, Jesus made the good confession before Pontius Pilate. What was that? What did he, now, remember, confess means to say along with, to say the same thing as. So, um, if I'm guilty of something, for instance, and somebody says you're guilty of that, confessing means you're right. Yeah. Uh, there's a person that says, if you confess me before man, I will confess you before my father. And that's how I see that. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So, what's the confession? What am I? What am I? What am I confessing? Okay. This is 
is the Son of God, right? Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Pilate asked him, so you know, so are you are you a king? And he said, I am the king. And the Jews just came out in his trial in Matthew 27 and said, you know, are you the son of God then? And Jesus said, yes, I am. I am the son of God. And so that's the that's the confession that that, that he gives. So now if I'm not willing to confess before men, if I'm not willing to say what Jesus said, if I'm not willing to say what God says about him before men, then he's not going to confess me before the angels of heaven or before the Father or the Lord Church. I've spoken of it. Um, and so this is important. And so, so he is the Son of God, um, and this is the, the foundation of the Christian faith. Upon this rock, upon this foundation, this mountain. You know, so G, you know, Peter, the Petra was like a little, like a stone. But the Petra, you know, the, the uh, Petros, the mountain, is the foundation, the confession that Jesus is the Son of God. If he's not, then this is just a uh, time to describe it how you like. Um, but that's the very foundation. So here we've got these, these Christians who are being, let's say, influenced. <laughs> They're going through some tough times to go back to Moses. Now we're going to be talking about Moses and Christ in this chapter. But you can see what the writer is after. Right? Um, and so let's go on and, and take it and continue. Any questions, comments? But yeah, this you know, just feel free to, to jump in there. So he was we're told here that that he, uh, Jesus, was faithful to him, to the Father, who appointed him, appointed him. Apostle and high priest of our confession, as Moses was in all his house. Now, I want you to see the comparison that's coming. He says, Moses was faithful in all God's house. For he has been counted, uh, excuse me. Yeah, faithful to him who appointed him as Moses was in all his house, for he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. He is superior to Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? You built the house, you obviously are superior to the house because it went for you. There would be no house. House depends on you for its very existence. Right? But look, but now he says, for every house is built by someone. Everybody knows that. But the builder of all things is God. Right? Now Moses was faithful in his house as a servant. For a uh, yeah, for 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 a servant, uh, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. What, what are we doing? Here? So all of these, all of that whole system, all of that Old Testament system is all pointed forward to something. So here we have a servant in. God's house. Certainly, we understand Moses to be a type of Christ, a leader, faithful to God in his house for testimony of, of the thing which should be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son 
over his house. Moses was a servant. Jesus was a son. Moses was in God's house. Jesus is over God's house. Now, if you're thinking about leaving and going back to Moses, this is going to be important to you. Okay. You're going to go back to a type of Christ. You're going to go back and follow a law given through angels to a servant of God as opposed to this law that was given by the Lord himself. See, so this is what we have to keep in mind as we then make application to ourselves. And as I said last week, we're not tempted to go back to the law of Moses because we've never lived under the law of Moses. That has never been a consideration of us. But there are inferior things that we can go back to. And the result that the writer will make clear will be the same result for us as their backsliding would be for them. There's no difference in the result. It's just the, the circumstances are different, but the result is going to be exactly the same. Uh, so in this book, there's, we have these, these two sides of that. So we have these encouragements and exhortations. And we also have warnings about if you do decide to go backwards, then you better be prepared for what's coming. Because you're going to get exactly what your life has brought you to deserve from God. That's what you're going to get. And that is not good. If you don't want to get what you deserve, then chapter two, listen up. Pay attention. And, and I really believe that this is This is a real, real, real danger for Christians that we, if we tend to think that by services and we sing and we pray and we give and we do these things, that doesn't mean you're listening or that I'm listening. I can do all that stuff and still be neglected. And here's and, and here's the, the and you and I think you can understand this. You can relate to what I'm about to say is that learning these things, whatever it is, not even necessarily biblical things, but it, it, when we learn something valuable, if the learning of it isn't the isn't the, the challenge, it's remembering, right? It's remembering these things. Um, and I know, and maybe this is true for you, <coughs> you said facetiously, that, that if you do something that you ought not to do, pretty much guaranteed that you have forgotten a whole bunch of things that will come to you immediately after you do what you should have done. Right? Oh, now you're feeling guilty. Now you're feeling discouraged. Now you got all this stuff coming over you because suddenly you remember what you told us to forget. Because that's what you wanted at the moment. So that's a danger that we, that we don't remember. So, so the writer is telling them, remember, pay attention. Okay? And he'll say this in many ways as we go. Yes. Uh, you see what? It's a thing you talked about earlier. It's a different to the strength and back. The what? The strength back. You know, when you go back and say, like you said, oh, yeah, we can go and uh, choose to go back in Moses' time. Yeah. So, with this, in my mind, I always thought it was like going back to a sinful life, but it's actually going back in the time of Moses and living under the law of Moses. Instead of the yeah. 
for them it was. Wow. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, for them, because they had lived under the law of Moses. Yeah. So they would they would go back to where they had been from. Oh, okay. Yeah. So my point was that we have never lived under the law of Moses, but yeah. there are things that we can go back to. But the things we'll go back to is the sand that we knew. That's right. The that yeah, the old life that we knew is what we would go back to if we would actually. And it's that drifting part that makes us so scared. Yeah. Yeah. I like what Peter says, he describes the, uh, you know, basically fruits of the Spirit in chapter one. And he says, practice the things. And he, then he says, I'll always remind you, and basically as an elementary principle, because that's what counts, but I've got to remind you that we are. Short, short side won't forget. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. I do think that he's sort of alluding to going back to an old system yeah. of thinking, of laws, and not letting the word of and Christ law dwell in you. We can do that as Christians when we go back to compromising. Um, making cultural compromises or, or compromising because of um, pressures or whatever that we have in life to compromise the values or the, the teachings that we have in the law of Christ and the freedoms and the liberty that we have because of his sacrifice. Um, and I, I think that that's where we, we want to go back to a system of going along the middle law rather than standing for Christ. And I think that in this particular episode, that the, the Jewish Christians felt this pressure to go back to get along with their, their family members or cultural members or whatever. They still felt that same kind of pressure as we can feel today when we come out of the world, but we get this pressure to feel like we need to get along with the world. Um, and, and I think that's where this particular passage is stronger to me. It's not just going back to sinful ways because we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. Right. We all do. But it's going back to a system of feeling like we're okay in this particular system of thinking rather than the word of God but, and renewing our minds in Christ. Yeah. And remember our Romans study that the first part was justification where God takes away his sins. But then the second section was sanctification. And so uh, dealing with the first dealing, the first part was dealing with what we did okay, in the justification, the things we did that were forgiven. The second part deals with who we are, sinners. Okay. And he has to deal, so he has, he has to deal with who we are. Right? And so um, We go back. We're not allowing God anymore to deal with what we are okay? and to keep us safe. So that's the that's the that's the uh, that's the point. Yeah, it's a. I think you went along with Gina's lines too. I think is thinking like we have to know what it is that your temptation to go back to is. Right. So for me, it's to go back and check us for Christianity. We should read my heart, we should read my mind, we should attendance and outward behavior, and I can stop working really easily and yeah. feel safe and fine and still be in my checkbox, which is not what Christ is all about, right? So you have to know your own justification. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we don't want to get into judgment day with that list. Yeah. And, uh, Lord, you know, not going to be impressed by it. <laughs> okay. So it, it's, it's, it's what we are. But what we do, he's taking care of that. He's paid the price for those sins. Those sins are always going to be there. You know, to one degree or another. If you say you have no sin, you're not going to go back in. Okay. Uh, that's going to be there. We're always going to deal with sin. There's always going to be a struggle. Okay. Uh, but it's it's what we are that we have to look at. 
but we are inside and allow God to sustain us. But that's a that's a you know, that's a whole big other subject. But uh, yeah, I was just thinking that our answer is the same as theirs. Just keep concentrating on the yeah. I mean, you just yeah. think, yeah, you just think about John the Baptist and Jesus, you know, we can't, like Jesus said, we can't and believe in the gospel, believe in the good news. Um, that's a big, that's a big statement. And to believe in the good news. We're forgiven, we're justified, we're sanctified. You know, God has done those things. Uh, the old man has been crucified with him. Um, you know, Christ died, Paul says, therefore we all die. All the Colossians for you have died. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. So the old man is dead. The question is, do we believe the old man is dead? If we believe that, and that we died with Christ, that when we were baptized and raised, we were raised with Christ. That stuff is done. We didn't do that. And by his doing, we are in Christ Jesus. I didn't put myself in Christ. God put me in Christ. So what I'm to do is live my life through that knowledge, knowing this. Well, I, just, I got all kinds of stuff that I want to teach you, and learn and teach you about, about these things. Um, but we're in Houston, we're so we'll continue. Okay, so Christ is faithful in the Son over his house, whose house we are, if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm to the end. If. So he talks about in chapter 2, verse 1, he mentioned drifting. Chapter 2, verse 3, he says, hold fast. And again, here at the end, hold, if we hold fast our confidence. In him, right? And our and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Right. So should Christians be braggers? So there's a no and there's a yes, and they're both true. Right? Okay, so I can't brag about me because all I've done is uh alienate myself from God and not live a good life on my own thing. But in Christ, if anyone boasts, let him boast in the Lord. So if I can say that uh, I'm a great man, I'm not afraid of death, I'm on my way to heaven, I will be in eternity with God. God will enjoy me being there. Right now, God is looking forward to me being there. I can say that. In Him. Yeah. yeah this is an interesting verse because he's, he's, or section because he's talking about Moses and the law and, 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 sort, of, and sort of putting that aside. But at the same time, this, this statement of boasting in our hope. You gotta ask, you gotta gut check yourself there, right? Are you are you is your life demonstrating confidence and boasting in in, in, in hope? Because that's a tall ask. That's not that's not a passive, I know I'm saved, let me keep it myself kind of a thing. And so even though he's saying, hey, that the this old law is not gonna save you. The checklists and the things, which didn't save anybody anyway, are not going to save you. Back as we said earlier, Moses Moses talked about what was going to happen in the future. That was Moses' role. But I do expect you to be confident and boast. And I'm not very good at that. I don't think that that's yeah. You know, and I, you know, I think you guys have been like me in the sense that. If I would say something about God to someone and when an opportunity came up, it was almost like, hey, I'm saying this and I want a response from this other person to agree and 
and uh, you know, I'm, I'm teaching this person something, as opposed to, you know what, there's some things that I know, and that I'm so glad that I know, you know, and sharing what you've been given, and letting that be. Kind of to, you know, to get a get a response. It's like you know teaching Bible classes, and I, you know, I think I'm a victim, quote unquote, of you know people teaching a whole bunch of Bible classes. You know, I, you know, swept up in that. Somebody teaches me and it baptizes me, and uh, and now they baptize me, and they've gone off to someone else, and I'm just kind of like, and I can drift right back out to the world. Uh, instead of okay. What is this baptism about? What, what am I, why am I being baptized? I mean, I wasn't aware of the fact that I'm doing this because I have died. That old man has been crucified with Christ, and now I'm to be buried. You know, the, the teaching, how do you get that? You know, I think people, the same thing, they, they wanted that response. And so I, I remember, I was, okay, I responded. And so I got up from the chair and went up to the building and, and I was baptized. And then later, you know, people apologized to me. Oh, you know, we were baptized and a lot of people who were, you know. So, yeah, so on the one hand, you know, I just remember being at work with this guy that, you know, he's shaking his head. Oh, you're just going, I'm like, what are you shaking your head at me for? You're so ashamed of me because I'm not going to church. You know, I was like, you got to be kidding me, man. And so, yeah, I responded. I got up on a chair. You wouldn't have been baptized me. You got another baptism in your book. You know? And then when you learn better, now you come in, now you come back and apologize to me because you, you baptized me, but then you just left. You just left me. Which is, you know, cool. I mean, first people learn, you know. But my point is that we need to we need to know and remember and think about what we're doing here. There have been occasions when I felt that uh, a person was being pushed into baptism sure. when he or she shouldn't have been. Yeah. And there have been occasions in my life I've been a Christian over 47 years when I realized that I had baptized without really understanding what I was doing. So I was rebaptized later. And sometimes, even to this day, you know, I learn I'm still wondering if I understand. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. And see, we can, it's easy to do that. And I've, I've done that many times. Uh, I've been back at that so. And I, and I, but, you know, I just, but I know. That I believe when I get out of that chair and went to be baptized, I believe that Jesus is God's son. And I believe that he was going to wash away my sins. Okay. So it's one of those things where, you know, what's the threshold? You know what I mean? And I, I still remember uh, years ago in another congregation where a little girl. Came up to be baptized, and she's like maybe 12 or something. She's a little girl, and I was like, you know, I didn't really know what to do with that. And then her, her, and her grandfather came to sit with me, and he says, He said to me in the midst of this, um, If you don't do it now, she's going to do it. So her family was, was pushing her to do that. And then one of those family members speaks up, and I'm up there going, like, wait a minute, this is a child. Yeah. Well, you know, you keep saying, I mean, there's the thought of, you know, did you just get wet the first time? You know, yeah. did you just get wet, were you really baptized? Uh, you know, you can you can string out all kinds of rationale there, you know, and, and uh, so you go in for the second time, and if the Lord baptized the first time, then I got but the second time, it was the point at which, you know, you have to say, look, what did I believe at the time? Yeah. You know, yeah. and just go from there because um, there's, a, there's a, 
It also goes back to working out your own salvation. You got to do what's right for you. What's yeah. right is a doubt is a sin. Mm -hmm. So I would yeah, say right. to someone, if you are doubting your baptism, yeah, it, it's personal. Yeah, no, I don't be grudging anybody. It's somebody doing that. That's what you want to do. Then, then that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Follow up, Peter. Yeah, I, it's a question that I have. Should we be so pushy to want to get somebody in the water after sequence of teaching when we don't feel that person really understands what is only committed to that act of baptism? Because one have to think we should do it. We've talked about the gospel, we should not be baptized. It's the logical sequence that Jesus gave us. But on the, on the other hand, we're not so sure that person is emotionally, mentally ready for that. Yeah. And I've seen this in the before. Yeah. Both of those fall away. Yeah. And that's a very young one of the many possible things. Yeah. That, that does happen. That does happen. Sure. So, so uh, I don't know. It's a hard thing it, when you're talking about another person and we don't know. Can't really know what they all we know is what people say. Mm -hmm. We go based on what they say. If they say, uh, you know, we think about Acts, the like Acts 11, you know, where you know, Peter's in the water, he's baptized. You know, they, they say they understand that's what they want to do. I can't refuse the water. I can't do that. And uh, what they do with that is going to be above to them. I just sitting here thinking, isn't this the way it's supposed to work, though? I mean, when you stop thinking about when we are taught, you know, or when we learn and we believe that Jesus Christ is God's Son and that He died for our sins and that forgiveness of sins have a bearing with Him with that, with the rest of the we come out a baby. That's right. It is the baby. You're going to learn a ton more. And when you talk about people falling away, I think about the parable of the soils. Yeah. Yeah. Some of it's going to fall on good ground, and that's going to bear a ton of fruit. And some of it's never going to grow at all. Yeah. And and yet, do we want to hinder anybody from doing and heeding that call? Because they belong to God. Oh, yeah. oh, and, yeah. and then it's just a matter of we as a church and as his body, loving them, being patient with them. Don't discourage them. Continue to be with them, befriend them, love them. Um, I, I think that's a great where we fall short. It's in that sec that that second part. Yeah. Follow up the second. I'm just understanding how important it is to seek baptism. Because it it's, you know, it's a continual have to baptize the believer. So it isn't like you do it so good at the beginning. Right. And that gives us set like a past the best right password. Now you're set. You live the baptized believer dead to sin every day, dead to sin. And that's why it's important to baptize them and live in constant repentance and then die over and over, die yourself over and over again. That is the teaching I think that we, if we're teaching it just a one time thing, that's more different than just once saved all these That's right. And that's what the uh, I think a lot of people in the religious world think we do. Yeah, I, well, I mean this is a this is a, a great discussion. I, I think at the at the end of the day our job is to is to sow the seed and the water and not get the interest. So yeah, to, to Tina's point, I mean, you know, a lot of times I think the failure comes in us not watering. Not always, but all of people are going to so I know, I know and people that have been baptized at nine and are faithful Christians in their 50s and 60s. And I know people who are baptized at 18 and 22 and they no longer serve the Lord. So it's all of the map. And experientially, we have our own experiences with that, right? right? But that's, we're in the, we're in the sowing and watering. But I think, I think what we can do, and this is back to the scripture that we're studying today, is we can show confidence in God, in Jesus, in the way of Jesus, and we can boast in the hope that we have. We can be excited about the fact that we're saved. We're not ta talking, of, we're not telling people, hey, it's, you should be ashamed because you're not saved. That's 
that's not it. We're excited because we are saved, because Jesus has given us this amazing thing, greater than Moses, who just talked about what was coming in the future. He wouldn't want to go back to the Old Testament. He wouldn't want to go to anything else right. in the world, right. because this is the most amazing thing. And, and, and if you want to be part of that, Jesus says that's what your God says that's what your life should look like. That's what he, that's what the writer is saying. Yeah. yeah, very good, very good. So verse seven begins a section of exhortation, and so in chapter one, remember Jesus was set forth as far superior to the angels. And then after that comparison to the angels, he exhorted them in chapter two, verses one through three, to stay firm. Don't take it lightly. Don't leave the, uh, the laws that Jesus gave and drift back to the law that was mediated by angels. And then in chapter 2 and verse 5, he began to describe Jesus as the perfect man, having presented him as perfect deity in chapter 1. But then in some of chapter 2, Jesus is that perfect man. And he comes to the conclusion that since he is such consider him okay uh, consider how great he really is and then here in verse 7 of chapter 3 he's comparing jesus uh, uh, to moses uh, he shows how great moses is but when all is said and done with moses in all of his greatness and his obedience and his willingness to serve God, he was just a servant, serving under the old law. But Jesus was the builder of the house. And so his conclusion, verse 7, Therefore, since these things are true, just as the Holy Spirit says, so now what he's telling them is this is inspired word. These are inspired words. They're words of David uh, back from in, in Psalm, in Psalm 95. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in the day of trial in the wilderness. So listen, if you hear his voice, Remember Jesus so many times said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And be careful how you listen. So if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me as in the day of trial in the wilderness. Where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So here we have another word. So we have uh, uh, drifting. We have not paying attention. We have straying or wandering in our heart. Wow, it's too bad we're out of time. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to have to pick up there and uh, and look at the conduct of these these people of God and uh, and what's happened. So lots of good lessons for learning. Thank you very much, Pastor.